I'm going to ask that you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And, and actually, the teaching tonight uh, is a teaching I've looked at, I've studied some, but I'm really kind of excited about sharing it with you because of some of the revelation that I've seen. It's, it deals with every man's work will be tested. Do you believe that? Um, it doesn't say it ought to be. It doesn't say it might. It says it will be tested, tried, revealed of what kind of quality that it is. And so I'm going to read a few scriptures in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 3 that actually kind of sits the back, uh, sets a background to see whom Paul is talking to. Uh, he's not talking to these great spiritual giants. In fact, listen what he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. I, brethren, at least he calls them brethren. I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh. I believe one version says carnal, which is sarkic, because it's, it's fleshly. And by that, he's not just talking about skin and bone. He's talking about their very response, their action comes out of the sensual and out of their natural desires as to babes in Christ. Now, it's, it's clear, you know, John speaks of babes in Christ, little children, <clears throat> young men, and then fathers. So there's levels of Christian growth. And uh, uh, so, so he said, uh, I spoke to you as babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink. <coughs> not solid food. Milk is pre-digested food. Something solid is that which you have to cut up. And, and so here's the condition of this church. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said, but you are not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. Or, uh, you're not able, which means they haven't grown as he expected. To you who are still fleshly, but since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? So these are the characteristics of a baby church that haven't grown. They're jealous, and they have strife. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then, or who then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Uh, or... Yeah, what, what, is, what is Paul? Servants to whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So they're just the vessel, he's saying. I planted a pile of water, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who planted nor the one who watered did anything, but God who causes the growth. I've heard this one time. It's called divine math mathematics. Paul says, I'm nothing. He says, Apollos is nothing. But he says, now... Uh, he who plants and he who waters are one. So he's kind of saying zero plus zero equals one. So that's that's divine mathematics. Then you add zeros to it, it increases. But he says we're really nothing. It's only God who causes the growth. Now he who plants, he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now up front, I've got to really remind you, we're not talking about reward as uh, a result of Salva for salvation. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a free gift. We, for by grace are you saved, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. But rewards is result of works. Every believer will receive rewards in this life and in the life to come. But not as result to go to heaven, but as result of our works and our faithfulness. So it's kind of this basis. He's talking to baby Christians, carnal, that you, you'd think, can they even understand what he's talking about? Well, we're going to see because he's going to lay it out by the Holy Spirit. Now he says in verse 9, and please notice this, we are God's fellow workers. I'm going to, I'm going to bring the marker board over so I can kind of uh, illustrate some of this. It's really important that we see this because as he talks, uh, he's really describing different aspects, di different dimensions. And he says, we're fellow workers. It's real life. We're co-laborers. You're not in this by yourself. It's God that's working in you. Did you know that we are co-laborers with God? That's pretty exciting that we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. So he reminds us that we're not in this by ourselves. 
In fact, Jesus says, I am with you unto the end of the age. But even though we're fellow laborers, notice what he says in this next verse before he tells us how that our works are going to be tested. He said, uh, you're God's fellow workers. Now, two things. You're God's field and God's building. So I'm going to write two words. These are two different dimensions. He said, you're God's field. And what else? Yeah, you're God's field and you're God's building. Now, this is important. There's two things because those are two different things. So let me just kind of go through this quickly without getting uh, bogged down somewhere. But when we think of a field, what do we think of? Well, we think of fruit. How is a field judged? By its fruit. Now, how is a building judged? A building is judged by the quality of the material that it's built on. And so I'm going to put quality of material. I mean, it can be beautiful, but if it isn't made out of the proper material, it can fall. Now, whenever, this is the groundwork. God said every man's work is going to be tested of what sort it is. Now, he lays the groundwork. He's talking to baby Christians that are carnal. Uh, they, they live after the flesh. They, they probably haven't been saved that long. Maybe they had been, but they haven't grown. Now, with this in mind, he's going to lay this groundwork. And this is very powerful. I, you're a fellow worker with God. Whenever you're studying the scriptures, there's what I call the law of first mention. So if I want to know something about, well, what is God's field? He's saying, we, you're God's field. I'm God's field. The church is God's field. That means that he has planted expecting fruit. We're God's building. And he's going to judge it by the quality of material, what it's built on. So that's what he's going to judge. Now, he's going to focus more on the quality of the material, but it's interesting that he mentions the field. So if I'm looking for, you know, how does God use this? How does he use the Bible? What's the symbolism? of? Then I would go back to scriptures. So what I'm going to do is give you some scriptures, and without going through them because it would take too long to do that, so let me just give you some scriptures. Uh, whenever you look at God's field, it's interesting in the book of Genesis, the law of first mention, there's really two fields. The first field that I would call a garden of field is the Garden of Eden. Now, that was lost by man. He was put out. But you know what is interesting? Today, as a believer, God invites us back into the Garden of Eden. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, it says, He who overcomes the church at Ephesus, I will give him or grant to him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that paradise had eaten a lot of symbolism. There's a tree of life. There's four rivers. All of those you understand have spiritual significance. But that's the spiritual reality of the field that we should be. Now, there's always that which is the negative. There is always that which is not of God. So we find God's field in Eden. But how many of you know there's Satan's field? Do you wonder where it is? I'm not going to read. I'm going to give you the scriptures, though. But it's found in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Uh, actually, it is Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. And remember when Cain and Abel, after Adam and Eve had been... Uh, put outside the garden that evidently they must have taught, understood something about offering and sacrifices. And when they brought their offerings to the Lord, what did Abel bring? He brought a blood offering. So they had to have some kind of instruction. Now, don't forget that it's really important. I'm going to show you why. What did Cain bring? Well, the scripture says they brought of the fruit, the produce of the ground which indicate man's labor. And God did not regard it. Now, you want, you know what? See, God looks at more than, well, it's just ground. And it's just, no, what God looks at is the heart that's behind it. He looks at our motive. 
So what do you think Cain's motive was? Well, the book of James, as well as the book of James, said he became angry, furious, to the degree that he killed his brother Abel. And the scripture says that he would not have done that if sin, and in the Hebrew there's a real possibility, that word sin means demon crouches at the door. So his work came out of jealousy, anger, and murder. So we have the fruit in this field. We see the fruit, the fruit of Abel and the fruit of Cain, the fruit of God and the fruit of man. Well, what was the fruit of Abel? It is interesting, I hope you can catch this, that Abel offered a blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But it is interesting, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, 14, just mark it down to read it later, it says the blood of Christ is offered by the eternal spirit. Are you aware of that? The blood of Christ is offered by the eternal spirit for our redemption. So the symbol, the sign of Way back there in the beginning, when Cain offered his sacrifice, it would be called dead works. It was a fruit of death. When Abel offered his sacrifice of blood, it was symbol symbolic of the fruit of the Spirit because wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is the presence, the reality of the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.10. That's God's field. Well, let's go to God's building. If I were to go back to the book of Genesis to understand what God's building, how does he compare it? Well, it's interesting because I found, I found something very, very interesting about God's building. Uh, we're talking about, uh, in fact, it says, take heed how every man builds. And uh, so let me, let me read a little bit further because you're going to see something about this building. And... Uh, Excuse me, as I turn the pages of my notes. Uh, you're going to see something very interesting about this particular building. And uh, I believe we have it here. Okay. In the book of Genesis, see, there's a building that man makes. There's a building that God makes. Are you aware of that? What do you think God's building is? He's building a spiritual building, which building we are, his church, but eventually the heavenly city, which is the bride that will come down. It's described in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. But what do you, So how do you know if it's God's building or man's building? Because he's going to test the quality of that building. Very major. So I go back to Genesis. I go back to the law of first mention. So I'm going to find some of the material or some of the building, what motivated men. And men's work is motivated by something different than if you're building for God. Okay. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And uh, because this is so important, I'm going to read just a little bit of it. And in verse 1, now the whole earth... Uh, used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Genesis eleven four, Come, let us build. There's something in all of us that wants to build. Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose uh, uh, a, a tower whose top will reach unto heaven or into heaven. And let us make for ourselves. You see the word ourselves is for their glory for ourselves a name. You know, the difference between God's building and our building is when we build for our name, when we build for our prosperity, when our our, we build for our uh, heritage. We build for our legacy. When it's for us, you can be pretty sure it's man's building. When we build for God's kingdom, you're, it's God's building. Someone has rightly said, one way you can test a true father, true apostolic, 
is that a true minister of God will, will use the ministry to build people. A false shepherd, a false apostle will use people to build his ministry. And the difference between God's building and men's building is who you're building it for. Men's building is for ourself, for our name, for our glory, for me. God's building is for his glory. Now, let's go a little bit further in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And this is a powerful verse. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. You know what the word purpose to do in other versions? Nothing that they imagine to do. Will, nothing will be impossible to them. You know why he says that? This is really important when you begin to understand the difference between God's work and man's work. I believe, listen carefully so you don't misunderstand, but I believe that there is a realm of what we call the fourth dimension. You've heard of it. It's real. It's valid. And, and I know in my life there have been times I have moved in it that God is exceedingly abundantly able to do above all that we ask or think. And the word think means visualize. See, God gives a dream. That dream has to be from him. That dream is birthed within us, not just in buildings, but, but whatever his desires are. We get his desire. We, he puts it in us. We bring it to the cross. We let him purify it. He puts it back in us. And it's like we, we let it, we let it uh, uh, grow, develop, until finally it is birthed. Someone has explained it like a hen hatching its egg. It's within us. And that's moving in the fourth dimension, no doubt about it. I've talked to many Christians. Some have been leaders through the years around the world. And that is how that they have seen. But it's in the spirit. But listen carefully. There is something powerful about the imagination. Are you aware of that? There are those outside the Christian fold. There are those who are non-Christian. And they have written books about the power of thinking. They understand the power of the imagination. But even in those cases, it can come forth. It's not by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's by a solical power. It can even be a demonic power. But let me tell you, I can assure you, even whatever may be man's work, it will come to naught. God will test it. And uh, and so they did whatever they imagined to do. There are many people today, even churches, denominations, ministries, buildings, that people are doing whatever they their heart imagined. But it doesn't mean it was God's heart. You understand that? It has to be God's heart, or it you can you can move in incredible psychic power. You can move in some demonic power. You can begin to. I mean, there is a power in visualizing and believing and believing and confessing it. But it doesn't mean it's of God. It can be for man's glory. It can be for man's own purpose. But it, I can tell you, no matter whatever it is, if God built it or man built it, I can assure you, every man's work will be tested. Do you believe that? Now, let's go a little further. Uh, back to... Uh, 1 Corinthians. And I want to show you the quality, because if, if we're going to look, especially at the building, he's going to tell us how this building will be taken and what to look for. And so, uh, let me find my place. Uh, in verse 10, he said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Now, before we build, we, we need the wise master builder, which the builder probably is talking about the, uh, like, uh, the architect, what it's to look like. So Paul is apostolic. The scripture says a foundation is built by the apostles and prophets. I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it, but let each man be careful how he builds upon it. 
The foundation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If more time permitted, I would tell you about that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, but I can tell you that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when, when the Lord asked Peter, whom do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. Reveal. But my Father who is in heaven, upon this rock I will build my church. Well, what rock? He just told us what it was. The Father has revealed it to you. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your brain cells didn't give this to you. Your human mind didn't figure it out. The Father who is in heaven is the one who revealed this to you. That is the revelation, the foundation that's being built upon. Now he says, be careful how you build on it. See, everyone is a builder. Everyone here. You're building on a foundation that's been laid here. Now, when he says, take heed how you build, he may be more specifically talking to two men. One would be uh, Timothy, who helped to build on the foundation that Paul had laid at Ephesus. Here in Corinth, it would have been Apostle, that great theologian, Jewish theologian from uh, Alexandria, who became a Christian, but who was taught, instructed more perfectly in the way of God by Quill and Priscilla. But he was there to help build on that foundation. But then finally he says, but everyone is. Everyone is building. Okay, then let's see. Because now he's going to tell you, we know by the fill we look for the fruit of the Spirit. But by the building, we look for something. There's some qualities of the material that's used. And he's going to bring us to it. Uh, he says, let each man be careful how he builds, not just what uh, we know it's, it's the temple of the Lord, but it's how. So maybe I should just say something uh, rather quickly regarding that because you don't just go anywhere and, and, and you say, well, they believe in Jesus Christ, so I'll just start building on my own. No, you have to be careful how you build. And you need to know the revelation of Christ for that city, that church, and that place. And when you know it all fits together according to Revelation 1, who is the order of Melchizedek, Christ, king, priest. But in chapter 2 and 3, he lists seven churches, and each of those churches has a distinct expression of the revelation of Christ for that city, for that church, because that's how they overcome. You understand that? To the angel of the church in, in uh, Ephesus, right? The one who walks, or the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden candlesticks, the church of Samura, he, uh, uh, the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, the church of Pergamon, uh, he who has a sharp two-edged sword, the church of uh, Thyatira, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, who feed her like Bernie's bronze, the church of Sardis. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, the church of Philadelphia. He says, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no man's open. And then the key, the church of Laodicea, the revelation of Jesus, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Once I saw that revelation, then I understood why and what happened at the church of Laodicea. I mean, they were a very prosperous church financially. They knew how to speak the word. They knew how to believe the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the grace of God. Well, what is the beginning of the grace of God? In the beginning was the word. See, we call them word churches, word Christians. They know how to speak the word, and it can happen. It's powerful. But uh -huh, you better be careful because you may, out of your own desire, build the wrong thing, and it will be tested. Every man's work will be tested. So be careful. We know who the foundation, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But we know we're to be careful how we build on that foundation, which is the revelation for Christ in that place. You see here, we are understanding Christ according to the order of Melchizedek. Years ago, there was a wonderful church I was pastoring, flourishing, and it was interesting because I left for another ministry, which I believe God had led me into, and another person came into that church. He was a wonderful man. He was a friend of mine. But you know what? 
He wasn't careful how he built on the foundation. That man's gone to be with the Lord now. But it was interesting. Almost everything I taught, believed where the church was going, the Holy Spirit, etc., was criticized, lambasted. And he built a foundation, but it was a foundation that he had been building upon in other places, but it, he wasn't taking care how he was building there because he didn't have a revelation of that place. It's really important. Now, here are, he goes further. Uh, For no man can lay any other foundation than one which is laid with Jesus Christ. That's not optional. In verse 12, now, if any man builds upon the foundation, remember how, be careful how, but he does give us the qualities. If any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, or straw, each man's work, each man's work will become evident for the day will test it or will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which is built upon remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is through fire. He's not talking about going to hell, okay? You're going to see. He will be saved. First, he'll be saved from himself, and he'll be saved from the dead works that could have destroyed him. But he himself shall be saved. Now, I want to, I want to point out something. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to, just for the sake of where I'm going with this, uh, Paul says that the quality of the building material, we're not talking about the fruit of the Spirit, that's God's field, but God's building, there are some materials that are possibly used. They're, in, in, they're divided into two different parts. One is gold, silver, precious stones. The other is wood, hay, stubble. But if you'll allow me, because kind of where I'm going to end this, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of turn it around and start with the wood, hay, stubble. Now, I'll try to do this pretty quickly, uh, but do you see anything that, uh, I believe that's two Bs? Yes. Uh, do you think, and then gold, silver, precious stones. But first of all, let's look at wood, hay, stubble. Uh, Do you see something that's unique about wood, hay, stubble? Well, I'll tell you what, just so you'll have, uh, I'm going to go over here, and maybe I should go ahead and put gold, uh, silver, and precious stones. Now, those are the two categories. You'll notice that the wood, hay, and stubble is kind of in declining order. And so they're going to be tested by fire. Now, he doesn't say the field is going to be tested by fire. It's going to be tested by its fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. But the building is going to be tested by the quality of the material that it's built of. Now, you can immediately see this is kind of a descending order. But what happens to wood, hay, and stubble if you put fire to it? It's going to burn up. So I'm going to show you in a moment what the fire is. It is his presence, incidentally. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, last verses, our God is a consuming fire. Which means there are many manifestations of that fire. The, it, it, in fact, the word, it, I think in the Greek, in the translation, is P-U-R, pronounced poor of all things. But it means a fire, a flame, and believe it or not, more literally, lightning. Because from the throne comes lightning flashes of lightning, sounds, and an earthquake. Now, all these can be burned up. It doesn't say that this man will go to hell. He will be saved, so is by fire. But these will produce things that not only will destroy him, but destroy others, because they're not lasting, they're not valuable. It's not his church. So God wants to save us from ourselves. And you know what it says? Every man's work will be tested. It doesn't matter. It could be a well-known work known all the world. It could be a little tiny. It doesn't matter. It will be tested. Thirty years ago, when the Lord tested my own heart and work, 
I remember one day out on this golf course and everything seemingly was lost. And it's like I had a vision around, I saw nothing but ashes. All the work, I thought such was the glorious minister, et cetera. And it did have its glory, just like ashes. And then the Lord showed me, it's like, open your hand. And guess what I saw? I will never forget this ever, as long as I live. My hand was full of gold, silver, and precious stones. And the Lord said, it took this, but I brought forth this. I had nothing except I had the most valuable material in the world to start all over. In a moment, if I have time, I'm going to tell you why the fire comes. Because God isn't just about destroying something. He's about destroying something so he can build something in your life. So let me give this real quickly, okay? And uh, I'm not going to be able to read all the scriptures, but I want to share with you something about man's building. Because remember how we will go back to the Old Testament and we will look at those different things. Uh, well, let me give you something. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. In this sense, the book of Daniel, I want to show you where wood, hay, and stubble. A few scriptures about it, okay? Uh, when I began to look, we know where wood comes from. It comes from a tree. Well, there's some pretty good trees in the scriptures. It speaks of the cedars of Lebanon. And, and it says, you will be like a tree uh, planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. But that's not the kind of a tree or the wood that he's talking about. There is a wood that, a tree that is vain glory. And so in the book of Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, if you want to turn with me. I think I can find it here. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Da Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a vision. And in this vision, he saw this huge tree. Uh, and uh, that's, I see, let me, yeah, I've almost uh, lost it. Oh, here we go. Found it. Uh, in this vision, he sees a tree. And uh, in fact, uh, here, here is a vision uh, in verse 10. Now, there were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. This is Nebuchadnezzar. I was looking. Behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. And the tree grew large and became strong as its height reached to the sky. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and and uh, in it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it. And the birds of the day dwelt in its branches. And all the living creatures uh, fed themselves from it. But you see, God sent holy angels and watchers who said, cut it down. And boy, was that a surprise. But you know who that was? In verse 22, it says, You, O king, you have become great and, and uh, growing strong. And your majesty has become great and reached into the, into the earth and your dominion. But he says, you're the one. And, and so I'm going to paraphrase. It's like you didn't give me the glory. And I am going to allow you to be like a beast for seven years. And you will eat like a beast. And your nails will grow like the nails of an eagle until those seven years are finished over. And then when Nebuchadnezzar looks up, and he recognizes that God is the one who brings everything to pass. You know what I have found? There are always those people that will, we're talking about building on God's foundation, okay? But the building they have is wood. It is from the majestic, but the purpose and the motivation is to build this glory and heritage to themselves for their glory. And to step back and say, look what I have done. Look at me. Let me tell you, size does not determine quality. It can be quality and be size, but it doesn't determine it. In fact, Paul warns against that. Sometimes in the beginning, it may be very small until God gets this done. Then he will release it. And so it's like a great tree. And they boast, look what I've done. And they may not do it outwardly, but inwardly, man, look what I've done. Come to my conference. You've got to hear me. I'm going to tell you how to do this. So, Daniel 4. Then the next one is hay. And that actually 
could be translated grass. Uh, there's some people who build a ministry. It's like they build it on grass. And you know what grass does? Let me read it. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. It flourishes real quickly. It's kind of shallow roots. It develops these little flowers. It looks very beautiful. It covers everything. But it says in verse 6 of Isaiah, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass and all and all its leveling is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, the spirit, Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. Let me tell you, whenever, say, when a church is built upon wood, these majestic trees, God is going to deal with it. But when a church is built hay or grass, it'll flourish very quickly. It'll have flowers. But see, it's flesh. They're built upon who I know and what I am and what I have. But when the word of God breathes upon it, I can guarantee you it'll fade and wither. And it becomes like straw. And it can burn very quickly. What is the stubble? This is an interesting. The stubble... See, so in, in the, when I was a child growing up and we, my father would cut the grain sorghums, uh, they usually would just cut off the stalk and then take the grain off of the stalk and, uh, and then separate the grain from the stalk. And there's always, we called it stubble, and then they would, they would shred up and that would become a, like a fertilizer. Well, that is the way they did in the ancient time. They literally pulled it up by the roots. Now, later that was burned. But the stubble were the weeds, the leftover, the tares. And, and then whatever was carried out of the field and separated from the grain, two things would happen, both fire and wind. The fire would burn up the stalks left over that were pulled up, what wasn't of any use. And then... The grain would be thrown in the air after it had been thrashed on the threshing floor and, the, and thrown up in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff. So it would be burned, and the wind would blow it away. Guess what? There are some Christians that are like stubble. They don't produce anything. They blow away like the wind. They'll burn up very quickly. They're the people who, who I mean, they're there on the foundation but they haven't taken root. They're, just, they're kind of the weeds, the tares. And they're like the shaft. Wherever the wind blows, see, there's a wind of God that blows us, but they're like, I call them wind Christians. Every wind of doctrine. And I've, I've known people, it's, wherever the wind blows, whatever's going on, they blow with the wind. And so it's called stubble. Now, let me go to the other, and I need to move pretty quickly. Let me go to the other. You, you see this, wood, hay, stubble. The foundation is destroyed, but this will be burned up because it no longer has value. Every man's work will be tested. No matter how beautiful a place may look, no matter how much grass they may have, no matter they may be filled with stubble, it is going to be burned. And it will be tested. He's not just talking about out there, by and by. He's talking about in this lifetime. Now, what about a work that is built on God? Gold, silver, precious stones. I want to show you Proverbs 16, 16. Gold is wisdom. It speaks, it speaks of uh, purity. It speaks of purity. It speaks of royalty. It speaks of value. Silver is understanding. The scripture says, with your un wisdom, get understanding. Now, let me read you from Proverbs. I think it's Proverbs 16, 16. I have so many notes here. Just kind of forgive me where I may get a little bit mixed up. But uh, Proverbs 16, 16. I'll read the scripture. I can find it here. Here it is. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding than to be chosen than silver. 
we have a friend, we, his nickname is Deke, and about a year or two years ago, he shared this with us. Daniel shared some, and, and, and I'd never heard. He began to study about gold and silver, and he began to discern that gold represented wisdom and silver represents understanding. And here, I'll just give you the scriptures without reading them. Uh, it's interesting that when David adorned, decorated, built the house of God, it says in, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11, if you want to write it down, that he used gold and silver. He used wisdom and understanding. But guess what? When Solomon was ministering and was king, in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 20, he had gold, but he had no silver. Because silver was not regarded as valuable. So you know what it is saying? If a man or woman is going to be used of God and build the house of the Lord upon the foundation, not only do they need wisdom, which is represented by gold, but they need understanding. That's the reason David so prospered. Solomon, in the beginning, understanding includes also discernment and skills. But when Solomon first came into kingship, he had silver. In fact, well, it says, and he had great discernment. But somehow it got lost. And here is what happened. Out of all his wives, there were those, I did a study of this several years ago, there were those foreign ones who pulled his heart away to other gods. And those weren't just any little idol. We're talking about Malcolm and, and one of the gods uh, uh, actually introduced the, the, the uh, death or the sacrifice of life children on an altar to be burned alive. Hideous, hideous demonic activity. But that was Solomon. Solomon, what happened to you? Well, if you will read the scriptures, in fact, where the understanding is darkened, they're given over to every form of sin. Ephesians 4.18. The book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 5, says where there is no, one version says knowledge, others say understanding, the people perish. And you'll find where there's no understanding that a person doesn't make it. Understanding is understanding how things work out and seeing the consequences and the effect. So there's wisdom and understanding. And guess what? There's knowledge. And I hadn't seen this till Josh was sharing with me. He talks about having knowledge. But this, I think he, he was sharing, he said, I think that's what the uh, jewels are. Gold, silver, precious stones. That is a knowledge of the things of God, letting them work out in our life. But anyhow, gold, silver, and then precious stones. Have I written that yet? No. I, oh, yeah, right there. Precious stones. So uh, let me share with you what I think the precious stones are. Uh, one. I think the precious stones, where we find them in the scriptures, is that one, the 12 tribes of Israel were listed with their names on the breastplate of the high priest we call the ephod. Each of those tribes had a stone that represented them. Each of those stones and tribes represented a quality and a blessing. I think you've already heard me share and others that that. As we pat, those represent dimensions, heavenly dimensions, that we move through into maturity. I've shared that a few weeks ago. And as we move through them, those stones and qualities are built in our life. And Paul speaks about adorning the gospel of God. We become adorned with that ephod. We become adorned with the 12 stones that the the walls of the foundation were garnished with every kind of uh, every kind of precious stone. In fact, the first was jasper, and then I believe it was an uh, sapphire, and then uh, 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 I want to say car. Uh, one is sardonyx and sapphire, and and. Uh, there's 12 of them, so I don't remember them at all right now. But they're all precious stones, and they all have qualities. And so the precious stones also 
Uh, so it's it's the 12 tribes as we go through those dimensions, those blessings, those challenges, overcoming, as well as the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the 12 foundation tribes. And as we walk through those in our life, then we're adorned with precious stones. It's a beautiful city, isn't it? Read Revelation 21. You'll find it. I know what the one I forgot. It says a jasper... Uh, and uh, the one I forgot was uh, Chalcedony, and then uh, there was a sort uh, emerald and a sardonyx, and sardius, and chrysophase, and uh, beryl, and topaz, and chrysolite, and jacinth, and amethyst. Those are some of the twelve apostles, and even the early church fathers understood that each of those colors represented a quality within a believer. Now let me go through real quick if I can. There's a few other verses. Let me, read, let me read the rest of those verses and just give a few insights and we'll be through. Um, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, Each man's work will become evident. Verse 13. Uh, For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of Here are the qualities of each man's work. And if any man's work which he has built upon remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet is to the fire. For the day of the Lord. What in the world day is he talking about? Is he talking about way out there when we see the Lord and he comes again? Well, that is a day of the Lord. But guess what? In Job's 1.6, there was a day when the sons of Israel met before the throne, before God, and Satan also came. Did you know Satan can have access to accuse? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 13, it says, And having done all to stand in the evil day. Have you read that? What's the evil day? Let me tell you what the evil day is. The evil day is when Satan comes personally. Satan is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. Neither are demons. Neither are the angels of Satan. And and Satan is not omnipresent, omnipotent. But there is a time when he will come to a person. He came to Jesus after the 40 days of fasting. And he tested him. Angels ministered to Jesus. And then he left until a more opportune time. I'm going to tell you, Satan, maybe once in your lifetime or sometime, he can come to you, to your family personally. I'm reluctant to say this, but in the past, I have seen the red dragon, a vision. I know the destruction. I know what it looks like, symbolic, in the spirit. Having done all to stand, stand. The day. There's a day of the Lord when Satan may come that God allows, but there's a day when Jesus comes. A lot of us think the only time that he comes is whenever the second coming. But any question I'll try to answer at the end. But And I know you probably have a lot. But see, it said uh, uh, to the church at Sardis, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Wake up and uh, remember how you received and heard. And uh, the things which you have wake uh, and the things which you have received and heard, repent. And he says, if you do not repent, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. There's a day and an hour. To the church of Pergamum, he said, but if you do not repent, I will come quickly, and I will make a, a I will make a war against them, those who were caused trouble, uh, with the sword of my mouth. See, the Lord comes to us and in us, but he can come to a church. He can come to us individually. He can come personally. Now, his presence will bring fire. Fire can protect, fire can deal with, fire can burn up, but it can also purify. Wow. I like to speak on uh, why God tests with fire, and that would be 1 Samuel chapter 30, the message to Ziklai, to David, but I'm going to do that for another time. That's There's too much value and wealth in that. But I do want to conclude near with this. Why does he say you'll receive a reward? So this will be my concluding part. Just to mention David a moment. David went through 12 different places when he was running from Saul. 
Why 12? Because 12 means apostolic government. See, he was promised that he would be a king. But he wasn't a king running around. I mean, he looked like he was in a lot of trouble. The truth is he had a kingdom within him. But it hadn't been manifested yet. Because God had to build the ability for him to hear God. You know, though he had the king and the throne within, it wasn't yet manifested. But guess what God was building in him? The priestly ministry. Now, in the Old Testament, a king couldn't be a priest. And a priest wasn't supposed to be a king. But guess who became not only a king, but he put on the ephod and prayed for Israel? That's priestly. Some other guy tried to do that, and he was struck dead with leprosy. Because David symbolized the order of Melchizedek. And the twelfth place was Ziklag, and it says it was burned with fire. Every man work will be tested, so as for fire. Ziklag was destroyed. It was recovered. God always recovers, always in restoration. God is a God who restores. Do you believe that? He will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Believe me. He will restore. When I walked on the beach of Florida over th uh, 30 years ago, my life was devastated, wiped out. There was no hope. And, and I was wishing, you've heard this story, that a wave would come in and wipe me out into the Atlantic Ocean. And the Holy Spirit says, you will be an example of my mercy and my restoration. Let me tell you, it didn't happen overnight. The first year, I put on 40-something pounds. I was in a depression. And I saw no hope. And it was interesting in the most unusual way. Everything that looked like could never be redeemed, God began to redeem it. And, and he still is. And you know what? I'm not sure you just receive one time, one day. There seems to be other days that he'll come and test the work. I think he's been testing this work. But after Ziklag was burned with fire, guess what happened? The one that opposed him the most died, Saul. And he became king of Judah for seven and a half years and then king of all Israel. Now, why does God allow us to be tested? Because God is bringing us into a dimension. And you, not only to have a priestly ministry develop, which is to hear God. That's what happened to David. How often he'd hear God. And he learned to wear the ephod, which was not permitted by king, but is by the Melchizedek order. Because, see, we're not in the Leviticus priesthood. We now have the priesthood of Melchizedek, who was king and priest. What happened? Burned with fire. Governmental authority, 12 different places. Now he goes to Judah. You know what God is bringing us into? If we were to go through those 12 tribes as I did some time ago, it was Reuben, Simeon, Levi. They developed the priestly order. Levi. David, same thing. He developed a priestly order and put on the ephod. Still had the king in him, but it wasn't manifested until after the fire. And then he comes to Judah. What is happening to us? Many of you have been to the fires. You have learned to hear God. You have learned to hear his voice. And you've wondered, God, why aren't you doing something? Well, he is. He's taking you to the fire, not to destroy, but to save you from what could destroy you. And he's going to bring us into that realm of Judah, of kingship, to reign with him. Seven churches, the last church, I counsel you to buy me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich. Next thing, they're seated with, to him that overcomes, I will grant you to be seated with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, king, kingship. He's bringing us to a new dimension, but it's through the fire. You ever heard that old song? Some through the water, some through the blood, some through the fire. Like some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. It's all by his blood. Let us bow together. Father, I thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Uh, Lord, even though you that we are tested, uh, yet, Lord, the fire is not to destroy us, but to destroy what was going to destroy us. And, and Lord, that is through that fire, you purify us, you develop you, you make us ready for that next dimension of kingship where we reign with you.
in heavenly places where, Lord, there are the blessings that are beyond anything we can imagine. And so tonight we bow before you. And, Lord, I thank you. Even though the testing has hurt, it's hard, it is difficult, I thank you, Lord, that we every man will be tested. But that which remains, we will receive rewards. As we overcome, there will be those jewels to adorn our lives with and adorn the gospel for your glory, Lord, and not for ours. Now with our heads bowed, how many of you have found your lives being tested by fire? It may be your finances. It may be your relationships. It may be in your job. It may be in any number of ways. But you have felt like you are going through hell. But I'm telling you, if you're on the foundation, there may not be much left like me with ashes. But out of that, he said, if you will bring, extract the precious out of the worthless, you will stand before kings. My purpose tonight is to begin extracting the precious out of the worthless because I was surrounded by ashes. How many of you tonight? You're, you've been on the foundation, you know Jesus Christ, but it's like all the fires of hell are sweeping around you. Our God is a consuming fire, but he is only burning up what would burn you up if it wasn't dealt with. And you say, Don, I desire his grace and his mercy for him to test that he may bring forth the gold, the silver, and the precious jewels. Let me just pray for you. If you don't just lift your hand and say, that's my prayer. So, Father... You know our hearts. There's nothing hidden from you. Lord, we have nothing to boast in but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you. It's some things I would not want to go back through. Uh, and Lord, those fires burned away things that probably would have never been burned away. I thank you even uh, today sometime for the fires that may come and, and whatever they may be. And Lord, you still remove and burn up the wood, hay, and stubble. I thank you for doing that, even though I thought they were beautiful and, and I didn't want to let go of them. But, Lord, I realized that was your choice. That was you, the wood, hay, and stubble of my life. But, Lord, I desire for you to bring forth in each one of us gold, silver, and precious stones, that you would bring forth wisdom and understanding and knowledge of your work and your ways. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.